Good news. We're all here to spend searching for the photo albums. I don't know how many there are, but I just found three of them this morning. So if there were more than three, I don't know, but there's three laying up in Pastor's office up there.
are, which they are anxiously awaiting to do. Um, also brought up to the doctor this week, they couldn't do the injection because of insurance screw ups, but whatever. And so we didn't have any injection or infusion this week, which you can't thank God enough because if he would have the injection, he would have probably been in bed for three days. But we had a busy Friday schedule. We had breakfast with his cousin in Middlebury. Then we had the Gaither concert, which is fabulous. And then we had a 60th anniversary party in Wombash for a couple that we met in Shipsalana like five years ago. And then we spent the night in Wombash. And if he would have had the infusion, he would have been home in bed. But instead, we got to go celebrate with everybody. So we came home yesterday. And when he had his doctor's appointment Wednesday, he had a very good lab report. And the doctor doesn't want to see him until August. So we are just absolutely, we can't thank everybody enough for their prayers and concerns. Yes, right remember. now we feel good. Prayer works. Yes, it does. Yeah. wanting to come. 
come to a church, and this was so convenient, so let's keep praying. Pray with us that they'll be here one of these Sundays. Father, our hearts are quiet before you, and where else can they be in the face of your power and your majesty and all you can do? And yet, Lord, today we are also, we will be reminded in the service that your creation is not always as wholesome as you have created us to be. And so you have made it possible we do not always choose what is best for your kingdom. And yet, Lord, you are faithful, you are merciful, you are gracious, and you are forgiving. So, Lord, this morning we pray, as the psalmist does, that you would remember us not for our faults, but for our hearts that seek your goodness, our hearts that seek to be your people. Lord, sometimes it's difficult. The pressures of the world, the, uh, the difficulties of life, the storms we experience, they do press a message on us to just give in, to just give up. And yet, Lord, in the midst of that storm, you are there, reminding us to place our hope in you, that even in this world, even amidst the storms, your kingdom is breaking through, 
your love is emerging more and more. And though we don't always see it, it is there. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness of healing, for lifting up those who have undergone surgery or those that are in a good space in the midst of treatment and in the midst of time of waiting for treatment. <coughs> Lord, I pray that they might restore them, that they might see you, that they might know what your healing is like. Our, the prayer of our hearts is that you would heal them completely. But we know that our bodies, they age. They grow weary and weak. And so we pray that, above all things, they would see you. We thank you for the encounter to minister to the community, to be able to reach out to neighbors, and for the excitement of the possibility of new faces and new life emerging in the midst of this place. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for mercy. We pray for the Lord. We pray that we might be a prism of light in the midst of their lives, that they may encounter you and know your grace and your mercy and your love. That they may come into your forgiveness. Lord, we're grateful for times of uh, being with family, being near loved ones. We thank you for the celebrations of life this week, for all of those who celebrate another year together. But Lord, most of all this morning, we pray that you would work in our hearts. That you would be present and you would send forth your spirit upon us today. That we may see you, we may know you, we may receive your word and it may penetrate our hearts and our minds. That we may live your life in the midst of the world around us. Lord, we pray today that you would remind us that you are our God. That we would commit once again to be your people, that we may walk in this world as your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, we pray all of these things in your precious and holy name, and all God's people say, Amen. 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 And I'll invite you, if you're able, to stand and as we sing the words of the doctrine. Says 
that Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples weren't able to find food. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them. And he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, for he is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call. A, cr a crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus raised the question. Who are my mothers and brothers? Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him, and he said, Here are my mothers and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. May the Lord add a blessing to read.
how could anyone stay here? And that's a hard question to ponder, especially after we've just sang the exuberating song about the truth. We come on, we gather on Sunday morning as a redeemed people, people who live under His forgiveness. In fact, Jesus in the crowd that day, those that were gathering and basically calling him evil, saying he was possessed, that they were trying to discredit him for his teachings. He, he goes on and he says, for your sins and your blasphemies, you'll be forgiven. But to reject the Holy Spirit and the movement of God in the world, you will not be forgiven for those things. It was a way of Jesus saying, I am coming, and it, it, this is at the beginning, remember, and so he hasn't quite fully revealed himself as the Son of God, but yet he, they begin to see him in all of his wisdom and all of his teaching, and then began, the religious leaders began to ask this question, is he of God, or is he, he of some, some of the spirit? And in this passage, Mark tells us that they blasphemy, that he was not who he said. That he was a son of evil. That his teachings were against the church, against the synagogue. But Jesus, of course, we know, would spend his life opening the world to a kingdom. A kingdom defined by God's love and forgiveness and mercy. So that his people may sing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the love. But for all of those who reject that, <coughs> Jesus would go on to say, you reject my spirit. And whomever rejects my spirit, that is something I cannot forgive. I cannot release you from that. Paul would later go on and say, he, he would talk a lot about how, why is it so easy to do the things I shouldn't do? And it's so difficult, but I understand the things that I should do, but yet I don't do. We understand that, don't, don't we? We also understand why Paul then would cry out and say, Lord, I do believe, but help now my unbelief. That the apostles almost embodied that prayer. That they understand themselves as sinful, as moral. And so we are reminded the week after we gathered at the communion table to remember our redemption in Jesus, we are reminded that the story is not always that way. That we are reminded in Genesis chapter 3 that God had created this wonderful, glorious, and splendor-filled world. He created the sun and moon. He created he created all of the inhabitants that, all of the creatures that teem, the little ants, and yes, even in this season with the cave. He created it all, and it was good. He looked on it and he said, how good and how wholesome. And he created Adam. And he realized that Adam was alone. So out of his ribs, he created Eve, a partner. Companion. Someone to walk in this world, someone to walk alongside of him, someone to, to work the garden, to enjoy the garden with. And in the midst of all of that, we come to chapter 3, which reminds us of the reason that Jesus came to save the world, that he came to save us. They came to save the church. Join me in chapter 3, starting in verse 8, where he said, Then the man and his wife, <coughs> he, they heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord cried out, calling them, saying, Where are you? And so Adam 
answer, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put me here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his words. And of course, we know that he also would go on and he would curse the ground. Um, but we get what we get today, which is we all plant gardens, and sometimes it doesn't turn out. Uh, most of the time, weeds come up. And half of the seasons, you know, I, I remember... About 10 years ago, when we were in this just this little slice outside of our house, one year we planted tomatoes, and it didn't work. So next year we planted a lot of tomatoes, and every single one of them worked. I don't know about you, but it, it, it's so difficult to get, we all know how many tomatoes you get in a season from a plant. And it's really difficult when you over, plant over it abundantly. And you get all these tomatoes and you look and you go, what in the world am I going to do with all these tomatoes? Oh, Cursed am I. <laughs> of course, for many of us, we, uh, yeah, I know you'll, most of us will connect with, the, you know, our grandmothers and our mothers, and maybe even we, yeah, we can miss them. You have to cook them down and you have to put them in jars and you uh, put them up for the season. But the reality is, is that God, is the, the passage we go on to, to, to recognize that even the earth itself or the consequences of the decision that Adam and Eve and by extension those that God chose and by extension even further you and I and the church we recognize that this world is still marked and marred by sin. Now I don't know about you but I like the redeemed side of the, of the story. I don't really like to sit around and think about the ways that I failed. The ways especially that I failed God, or maybe even, you know, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I don't like to think about those things, but they're a real part of our story. It's a real part of our walk with God. It's a real walk of what it means to be is to recognize ourselves as sinners, as imperfect people, people that choose against the will of God. And it's not hard for us to understand that we live in a world that likes to hold sin or failure over people. I remember long ago when I was younger, and coming right out of college and reading all these things about the business world and how to develop how to grow and be a strong leader. And one of those books simply points out the advice is this. Remember, out of the ten things you do in the world, people don't remember you for the nine that you did well. They remember you for the one you did not do well. And isn't that a perfect, for me, that's a perfect image of the way that the world is is, is different from the church. The way the world is separated and cursed, we have this tendency to hold people responsible. And sometimes, let me be honest, we enjoy holding people responsible for the things they do wrong, forgetting the things that they do right. I think it's a good image of the ways of the world versus the way of the kingdom of what Jesus is asking us to do. And he's wanting us to hearken back 
the, the, the whole narrative today, whether it's in Mark, if we put that together with the poet who asks the question, what would we do? What could we do if God rem only remembered our sins? That's the aim of the question. <coughs> and we get that, and we get this passage in Genesis 3 that reminds us of the choice and the consequence of Adam and Eve's. They were enjoying the presence of God. Wonderful place to be, huh? They were fully recognizing the presence of God. God came down in the midst of them, and in the cool of the day would walk with them, would fellowship with them, would commune with them. And I imagine one day God had this conversation and said, I love this place, but I have to warn you. See that tree over there? See that wonderful, beautiful tree? Don't touch it. Don't eat it. And in a moment, something entered the hearts and the minds of Adam and Eve. I wonder how many days, how many years as they sat there and smoked. something wrong, we don't admit it, but rather we make excuses. We point our finger. We say it's someone else's fault. Of course, all of you who have raised children know that that's exactly what Especially preachers can see that. Um, but it's a side that we have to reflect on. And we have to reflect on it because it is our reality. That we are broken, we are sinful. We even in our journey to become perfected by God day by day, in our journey of taking up our cross moment by moment, we too stumble and fall. That Paul says, if anyone says they are not a sinner, they are not of God. Every one of us is our sinners saved by grace. And again, I love thinking about by grace. I don't like so much thinking I'm a sinner. But the reason God's grace is there in the world that we live in is because God is looking to redeem us. That every single day of our journeys are not just about recognizing the cursed world we live in. A world that is broken, a world where relationships are not always wholesome. <clears throat> a world where it's a struggle not to blame others, 
in the midst of that world, the reason that God is here and sends Jesus is, is that we may know that we are redeemed because we are sinners. Now, I know all of you, you're all now starting to reflect, oh, Lord, forgive me because I'm a sinner. No, you know, in human tendency, you're probably thinking, oh, Lord, would you deal with my sister's sin first? <laughs> deal with my spouse. But in that process, we're painfully aware of this cursedness that has occurred. It perfectly describes the world we live in. <coughs> that it's broken. It's hurting. And that we don't even want it perfectly. So what makes the church different? What makes us mothers and brothers and fathers and Sin is not, leaving us in our sin is not God's picture. It's not what he is attempting to do. While we bear out the consequences of our decision, while we sometimes choose consciously to not be very good listeners or followers of God, God still said, but I still sent my son, my presence, into the midst of you, that you might that you might be lifted out of that place and say each and every day that you get up you get another chance that you are redeemed redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb it's important for us to pause and to recognize not just the goodness of the story but what leads us to that place and if you think for a moment that the Bible is not full of stories and that those stories are not the same struggles that we have today, you're fooling yourself. That even the church today doesn't get it right. That we don't always listen to God because it's uncomfortable, because we don't want to hear it, too much. That oftentimes we rely upon our own strength rather than the voice of God. It's almost, I, 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 in our walk of faith, in our walk towards full redemption, I, I almost always remember the posture of our heart should be that of the early disciples. Who, when Judas Iscariot had gone and was no more, they needed to replace one of his brothers. And they went through this process and they uh, identified this one called Matthias. They drew straws, they cast lots. They had a vote, but they chose him. But right before, they said, Lord, this is the one we have chosen. But who is it that you have chosen? We've done our work. And how often do we come as a church before God and say, God, we really thought of this. And we have a great solution. We have a great opportunity. But Lord, it's in your hands. Sometimes the sin that we embrace so easily is realize, is, is thinking that we can do this without first laying at God's feet, at the feet of Jesus. And saying, Lord, we want to hear from you. Because sometimes in the midst of that, what sin convinces us of, us of is our will is better than his. And so you don't need to listen to him. Don't worry about it. I know what he told you. He told you not to eat of that the fruit of the tree over here. Ah, come on. Did he really say that? What's it going to hurt? Just take a little bit. Take a bite. Just take the bite of not asking God to come in for what he brings in. But we don't think. 
listen to him, when you would listen to him talk, and you would watch as his, he transformed a body of people that were divided. A group of pastors once asked him, what is it that you're doing? And he said, well, when we have a decision to make, now we're not talking about, you know, who takes out the trash. But when there is something significant that we are divided on, we bring it before the leadership. And the leadership talks about it, and then we go home and we pray about it. And then the leadership comes back together and we talk about it. And then we pray about it. And then the leadership gets together. And he says, no less than three times did we, would we meet on one single issue that we were divided on. It was a minimum of three times, and he said sometimes it would be 12 or 15 times that we had to lay it at the feet of God and say, God, you need to tell us. And he would then talk about the emergence of how the Spirit would move in ways that were far different than the direction that they had ever been in. And it would change the hearts of those people. Churches that thrive are churches that put their community at the feet of God. Not in the spirit of saying, God, help these heathens. Make them submit. But say, Lord, we give them to you because we love them and we know that you love them. And so show us how to breathe life into them. Show us how to give your redemption that we have been gifted with to them. Transform them. And in the moments where we want to give up, Lord, breathe the Spirit upon them. So often, it's like God's in the middle, and we say, well, we would rather hide behind the tree. It's much more comfortable behind the tree. And God says, where are you? Now, God didn't say, can you please send me, could you text me your coordinates so I can pull you up on GPS? Uh, you know, pull you up on MapQuest and see how far I have to walk to find you. <laughs> no. God was asking them, where are you? Why are you separated from me? Why are you saying about my plan is so cursed be this snake, this serpent who will crawl and eat dust all the days of it, its life. The one that we would be at would be at odds with him and what he is trying to do. Would be at odds with his creation. God said, but I am preparing the world now for the redemption I will give in them, give to them, to the ones who came to you. He says, those of you who heed my voice, those of you who listen and believe that I am of the Father, it is you who belong as my mother and brothers and fathers. And when you, from this point on, stumble, 
those things will be for you. But if you look at me and say, you are not who you say you are, for that I can do nothing. I really think this passage is one of God showing us sin of not offering our thoughts and our hearts to God in decision. Our hearts and our communities for God. And God says that's, that, that will be for you. But the consequence of that is seeing a whole neighborhood who may never know my light and my love and my mercy. Community Garage say they are not opportunities just to get rid of each other. They're always an opportunity. What is it that you need and walking with someone? Let us learn to listen and to embrace what God is speaking. Let us learn to put him in the middle of all of our decisions, all of the things that we do. That the community around us, no matter how opposed they may seem, we may be laying them at the feet of Jesus each and every week to say, Lord, work in their hearts and work through us. Because how many of us would like somebody to be out there cursing us? I really wish they'd uh, understand their own scriptures. That cursed is man, cursed is woman, cursed is the crown. No! We want people to love us. And so we have to work hard to love them. May we commit to that. Heavenly Father, in the midst of your redemption, we are faced with the unsettledness of sin, of our failure. Sometimes that failure is just that we do not ask for your opinion, your thought. Because if you gave us a great idea, it's got to be a great idea. We don't want great ideas to live. We want spirit-filled ideas. That you may transform this community, that we may lay them at your feet, that we may pray for them daily, that we may ask them what they need and walk beside them, that they may know your love, your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness as we have come to know it. That we would choose today not to remember and not to hold against them the one thing out of ten that they did to you. But that we would remember the nine ways. Lord, help us to be your people by surrendering our hearts, our sins, and our community to you. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. And as the musicians come forward to lead us,
um, I think it's appropriate that we sing I Surrender All. The good parts, and especially the bad parts. Before a God who doesn't remember our sins when we give them into his hand, he doesn't remember them. He only sees us through his love, his grace, and his mercy. But we have to lay who we are into his hands and say, Lord, use me and mold me. Let's stand this way. Send us now to be your love. 